Hi, my name is Monal Pramar from AI Masters, and we have a segment called AI Talks where we meet with the founders of AI startups and ask them about their company. Today we have a very special guest, Arnav Choudhury. So Arnav, uh, could you tell us about yourself and about Mesh? First of all, you got my last name correct. That's, that's perfect. Like, very <laughs> few people can actually like, pronounce it correctly. So uh, I'm Arnav, and I'm a part of a startup called Mesh. So at Mesh, we optimize presentations in real time um, using the presenter's audio, essentially. Cool. Can you tell everyone about what problem your company is solving and what you do? Okay, so the problem essentially is a lack of feedback. So as if you're talking to an audience which is like more than 50 people uh, in person, or let's say it's an online course, webinar or something, you essentially, the speaker, the presenter has no feedback how the talk is essentially going. Mm -hmm. So in that scenario, we kind of give them feedback on how to improve their future talks or adapt the current talks. Now in this year of higher education, which is like the market we are going after right now, it tells the professors where to focus their teaching efforts in real time. That's definitely a huge problem you guys are solving. There's an effect called the bystander effect where if, if no one around you is speaking up, you're not going to be speaking up. It's been shown that with just two bystanders, uh, it, it has a significant impact on the individual. So now imagine 200 people in the classroom. Could you tell us how exactly you guys are solving that problem? Um, so Mesh is a web app. So we essentially, uh, so there are two or three different ways. So First of all, you want to pr promote uh, a sense of belonging in the classroom because I feel like right now, if you can, if you're in a classroom, two hundred people, they're like two hundred individuals as opposed to like a group. So that's one thing. So one way of doing that is to promote interactivity, interactivity. I don't know if I pronounced it right, uh, between the professor and the student, and Definitely. between students. That kind of promotes the whole sense of a group setting in a very large classroom. So it makes them feel comfortable. They care a bit more about their studies. And the biggest issue is because the most, the, the people, the users, uh, when it comes to students are going to be uh, undergraduates. And most of what we do in university is not to maximize studying, it's to minimize studying. Definitely. So that's an interesting problem there, you know, how to make them learn more without actually making them put more time. So that's actually one of the things that we are really looking at, like how to make their lives easier, but at the same time maximize learning. Could you walk us through the use case? for how the professor and students would, would be using your uh, your platform? So Mesh is a web app, so making it like gloss platform comparative, all that stuff. So students use their phones, laptops, iPads, whatever. Uh, let's say professor asks a question, you know, students answer it, and then we figure out how, how similar answers, uh, if the answers were kind of correct or not, and kind of make like a semantic map, if you will. Kind of like uh, how TSNE works, sort of. So, uh, so it's like, you know, how to map uh, words in a way that kind of uh, words from a higher dimensional space to a, to a just a 2D space, mm -hmm. but still preserve the structure of the semantic structure. So this provides insights into how the people are responding to their lecture in real time. Uh, but now it really differs because some people, some professors care about that and they would just like stop and like, hey, you guys did not get it. Let's go back and do this again. Some people just do not care. <laughs> Now for people who don't care or, or who think it's just better use of the time if they would come prepared to address it in the next class, we have a thing called history, class history, which essentially uses this kind of feedback, another kind of feedback from the audio with the way they're talking, that kind of stuff, and summarizes the lecture into just like six, seven points. So within like minutes, uh, uh, at night or whatever, whenever they want, they can quickly see uh, what essentially went wrong or what went right. And the best part about this is the data we get, uh, you can access it like the day after the lecture, the week after the lecture, after the quarter is over, whenever you want, you could come back to it once your lecture is over, once your class is over, the next time you're teaching. So the data never kind of like, you know, uh, goes away. That's great. They have, a, they have a new means for improvement. Why are you better than uh, existing solutions in the market? So existing solutions, A, uh, their only focus is on like the polling feature. They only ask questions and that's actually the way the market has actually been trained so far too. Like you know the whole idea of Pavlovian dogs. Because A, everyone is used to paying, making students pay. That's one thing. Uh, secondly, uh, everyone is just thinking of like you know, asking questions and answering questions, that kind of stuff. We have a different take on that. Uh, we are not really trying to like, you know, sell the app. We're really trying to sell the data or the insights on the data. 
So that's very, very different. So that's a very interesting way of trying to penetrate the market. Offering service for free is definitely a way that you can uh, get, gain uh, quite a bit of market share. I didn't say it's, it's going to be free for soon. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so we actually do not really know exactly mm -hmm. if we how the way we're going to charge students or professors. We for sure know we, we won't charge professors, and most likely we won't charge students. If it was going to be like minimal, minimal, but the real business and the real uh, company, if you will, is in the data. Yeah, I mean, I'll be happy to pay for it, for that service, to be able to say, hey, I'm confused, or I have these questions, like, yeah, that, that's definitely something I think students would be willing to pay for. So, so there's there's a lot of students who um, are, in, you know, in your position, or who, who've, who've, uh, who've taken the classes you've taken, have, have went through UCSD, uh, who might want to start a company. So uh, could you tell us about, uh, you know, what initially motivated you to start Mesh? Ooh, so it was like, not like, you know, I don't have like a fancy story that, you know, I had, I noticed a problem and I was doing this. It was just like I was in bed and I was like, huh, that's going to be so cool. Let's, let's try to do this. And the moment I had the idea, I got up, called one of my friends and yeah, we met the next day and I guess that's how it started. Yeah. So, so you hear that students, if you have an idea, just go build it. Like what steps do you take to get to where you're at right now? A lot of hard work, a lot of hard work and, and a lot of coffee. Uh, so, I would say like initially the mistake I made was being an engineer, you know, I like to think of theory, get the th theory right, and then I would maybe try to put it into practice, but that is not the best use of your time. And that's something I learned quite early on, thankfully, because for the first like two or three months, I took like 10 online courses, like, you know, taught myself a bunch of different things. And I used like, it was crazy, like three hours a, a, a night for like five, six months. and didn't like I gained a lot in terms of knowledge I learned a lot I, kn I knew a lot mm -hmm. but when it you know came time to actually put it in practice I did not know anything so that's something I learned uh, that it's better to actually try implementing stuff and then learn as you implement as opposed to first try learning everything and then implementing it makes uh, sense yeah and even like now when I'm trying to like learn a uh, new like machine learning deep learning that kind of stuff you know, I can obviously take a book of statistical natural language processing which is going to be like a 500 page book, read it, try to read it, but it won't really make sense unless until you actually try to like implement it. Because frankly, uh, with the frameworks uh, right now, you don't really have to understand how like an LSTM works. Like you can just try implementing it, tweak it, see what's happening. In case it doesn't really work at all, then try digging into the theory and see if you can do something about it. Like, you know, cause you don't want to like, you know, now start actually building your own framework because PhDs make a living doing that. Yeah, that, that's actually a very good point you brought up, the, the uh, process of learning about deep learning. So here at AI Masters, we have, we have an amazing platform to, uh, to allow le uh, learners from all levels to learn about deep learning. So, so there's, there's a plug for AI Masters. Um, so, so, you know, you're using a lot of cutting edge technologies. Um, could, could you... Uh, can you like specify like with some of the specific algorithms you guys are using? Are you guys using LSTMs? Are you guys using? Are you guys um, uh, uh, doing a lot of natural language processing? Like, wh what are you guys doing? So we are using definitely using LSTMs. We are using bidirectional LSTMs. Uh, we are using convolutional neural networks. Uh, all like the, all the fancy <laughs> that kind of stuff. Yeah. CNNs. So you guys are dealing with images yes, too. Yes. Yes. CNNs for text. Text. Oh, yeah. so, so is, is it like uh, pictures of the board or what? Oh, no, there's just, there, there are no images. You can use CNNs on text. Oh, and, okay, yeah. Okay. And, and, and that's actually like a part of like where the slightly novel stuff happens because people generally think of CNNs as only for images. And the funny thing is most of the, even the frameworks, like if you, if you, even if you try to learn TensorFlow, then I have a tutorial on, on MNIST image data. Yeah. Almost every single uh, deep learning framework, everything, they, they start off with like an image data set because frankly, most algorithms developed so far are for dealing with that. But if you want to like, you know, do something slightly cool, uh, if you try using like CNN and that kind of stuff on text, it act, you can make it work. So yeah, it's, it's like really they're data agnostic. Um, so, so you can use any, I've, I've seen people use speech, speech and do uh, convert the speech into a spectrogram and use CNNs with that. So there's really uh, all types of data you can use with those types of networks. So what types of uh, knowledge, skills, and frameworks should students learn um, in order to be, be uh, uh, prepare themselves for a successful career in AI at Mesh? Ooh, okay. Uh, I would say just like 
I wouldn't even say you know you need to know a lot because frankly, so I I interviewed someone like two days back, and that guy is like into computer programming all that stuff. He taught himself uh, deep learning in a month. Like he knows deep learning. I'm not even saying he knows tens of flows. I mean he knows deep learning. He was able to train a generative chatbot uh, using like two or three recurrent neural networks, and. in like 14 hours <laughs> he built it from scratch in 14 hours so it's more like you know having the the will and the time to learn something uh, so if you like if you're hungry you can you can you can make it work and that's actually the kind of stuff i look for to i don't really care if you have like a phd a phd would help uh, but you know you don't need, need to have those kind of skills to begin with but as long as uh, you have the time or you want to learn something just go for it and that's And that kind of ties in well with what Mesh is, right? We are we are all about like learning, and that's how we promote. Even the tagline is confusion is good. You have to be confused, then you have to be frustrated, and that's when maximum maximum learning happens. And that can only happen if you just, you know, dive in, just jump, just go for it. You know, it's a really good advice. So so it's interesting. You you mentioned that the uh, the person you were interviewing worked on uh, a chat bot, right? So, uh, what types of projects do you recommend that students work on right now, uh, and that are uh, relevant to the type of work you do at Mesh? Sure. So, Mesh is mostly NLP and text mining, mm-hmm. text analytics, predictive models. So, if you do something along those lines, that always helps. And now, the 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 thing about text is that you know you can know a lot of machine learning in general. You can know clustering, blah blah blah. But then these. The way those models work, algorithms work, is not really applicable to text because text is sort of like weird because you can have just one word in entire data set, and that one word can determine like what the topic of the data set is, for example. So that's like the kind of like the issue or the challenge with uh, text mining. So anything which involves like you know uh, textual data in any uh, in any way would help. So projects that involve text and deep learning or and machine learning. Okay, cool. So, what are your goals for uh, for this year, and also where do you see your company in five years from now? Ooh, that's that's a great question. Uh, goals for now would be so we are trying to ramp up. Uh, so goals first of all, like the biggest issue is with the change in the current uh, political landscape. So. How to adapt to those kind of things? Because I'm pretty sure there might be a lot of new policies that might be implemented very quickly, and that's something you have to be careful about. So that's actually one of the biggest uh, things I'm worried about personally. Uh, what kind of policies will come into play? How can we adapt quickly? Will the business model remain the same? You know that kind of stuff. Five years from now, I hope Mesh can you know uh, Mesh can be in a place where it can like. predict uh predict the material the content like help professors make make recommendations to the professor on how to teach in real time so right now the only thing is we tell you that hey people don't seem to be like you know understanding what you're saying but then the next question is what do i do now so that that's what we want to do eventually is actually have like your the professor's side kick if you will in his pocket in his other pocket So that would be very cool. We'd be pretty awesome, and especially since the uh, all the data you're collecting from uh, people teaching the same class, there's definitely uh, things that some professors did right that you can use and uh, give hints or uh, feedback to other professors. Yeah, yeah, and if you actually start doing the same kind of stuff on professor to professor, that can also become something very cool because then you can like group similar professors together. You know that kind of stuff. These are the ones you should fire. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so what do you think your startup's uh, greatest contribution to education will be? To improve uh, student learning in a crowded classroom, essentially, uh, because you can be. I mean, you paid a lot of money to come to school. You deserve better. Uh, if you're taking math when you see like you know, you're like one of two hundred. You don't feel like you know a person. You feel like a number. So we kind of want to change that. We want to, you know, improve interactivity and a, a sense of uh, group belonging in the classroom. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Well, we here at AI Master hope you your company has a lot of success and and you change the educational education system. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank much you. for being here. Thank you for having me here.